in life. Do I have it on share screen or still? Or are you, what's going on, Jesus? Okay. I have it on share screen, but we can both share screen. Do you want me to stop? No, you can share screen. Okay. Yeah. I'll start us off and then you'll um, bring us in. Sure. All right, everyone. Today, our info session for the Black Achievement Fund is on a question that we get asked all the time. And that is, how are we going to protect our communities? You want to scroll up, Jesus? When we talk about building an all-Black town, when we talk about building an all-Black municipality, a lot of Black people look at history. They look at what happened to Black Wall Street. They look at what happened to Rosewood. They look at what happened to Wilmington, North Carolina, and other places like this. And they begin to think that by associating ourselves in an all-Black community, we are making ourselves a target that we are opening ourselves up to racist violence and things of that nature. <clears throat> so we wanted this week to address the whole issue of how we as black people, or as the Black Achievement Fund, how we protect our little Kemet compound and how we protect other black communities. So the first thing I wanna say is that they're already a multitude of black, all black communities, all black municipalities that currently exist today. We are in a totally different era, totally different time. So one of the things we wanna start off is, is the fear justified in the first place? Uh, you wanna take over for a second, Jesus? Sure. I mean, you know, I don't want to downplay, right? And we don't want to downplay as an organization um, where this fear comes from, right? So our people have been victims of terrorism since our arrival on this continent, right? That's, that's, that's just straight history. So for us to be fearful of retribution and terrorism from our stated enemies is not something that's far-fetched. And we do want to acknowledge that, right? But we also have to acknowledge that times have somewhat changed. And I'm not gonna say that this terrorism does not still exist because we see many instances of their, ter their terrorism every day. Every time we turn on the news, we see this. But what does it mean for them to attack us in an all black town that is completely armed, trained, and a gated community with the thought process in mind of expecting some type of conflict? How does that look? And what is it, it, it? And then we have to ask ourselves: Are is that fear justified? Are we justified in this type of fear? And are we going to let this fear ultimately stop us from self determination? Right? Because that's the other thing for us to sit here and, as the Black Achievement Fund, tell you that we can guarantee that nothing will happen is a lie. We can't guarantee anything, but what we can guarantee is that we will be well prepared well-trained, and we have systems in place, both that we will state and that we won't state, right? Because you don't wanna show your hand to your enemy um, throughout the process, right? So we are, we are conscious of these things, we're preparing for these things, and we know these things are a possible reality, I'm sorry. But are we gonna stop that? Are we gonna, are we gonna let that fear stop us from creating what we all deserve, right? Being great. Go ahead. Yeah, no, are we going to let it? I was just repeating what you were saying. Are we going to let fear stop us from creating black municipalities that operate within our value system and that sort of thing? Is that going to be the cause of us not doing this? Right. And because we have to remember that is the goal of terrorism. The absolute goal of their terrorism is to make us fearful enough where we'll never unite, we'll never build our own, and we'll never grow as a community and become self-sufficient. 
So are we let the, are we going to let these scoundrels defeat us from getting to our goal and continuing the work of our ancestors? The Black Achievement Fund does not believe that we're going to do so, and we will not allow them to scare us into becoming who we should be as a people, right? But today we're going to go over some of the things we have in place in order to protect us from that possibility. All right, so we're going to go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was waiting for the next slide. All right. It all starts in the home. You have to be prepared to protect your home in any type of situation. It all cannot be the job of someone else. We live in a country where toting a gun is part of religion almost. And unfortunately, in order for us to be able to protect ourselves, we have to understand that we have a right to bear arms just like anybody else in this country. I often say in a philosophical uh, way, you would think we all know that we were enslaved because of guns, because we didn't have guns. You would think that after enslavement and black people could have guns, that we would have more guns per capita than anybody else in the world, but that's still not the case. So the first thing is it starts at home. Every household should be able to protect itself, should have a firearm, but more so than that, you have to be trained. You have to know firearm safety because many of us have children in households and we don't want to start an epidemic where children are getting a hold of guns and having access to guns um, and shooting up schools and killing. We don't wanna create that type of culture, but we need to take a realistic understanding of how we protect ourselves first individually before we can protect ourselves as a community. Because at the end of the day, when you look at how this whole country was started, they didn't have a military. It was the, every single person was armed. And when it came time for a conflict, all of those individual people, all of those individual arms was enough compelling force to win their battle. So we encourage everyone, every black person to take their home protection seriously, take their personal protection seriously. Guns are legal and we need to learn how to use them and we need to have them. I mean, I can't say it any plainer than that. All right, and so <clears throat> our key mentioned fire, fire, firearm training for every member of the community and that will be provided for every member of our community. Because like our key said, the goal is, is to protect each other, right? and protect our home, but the best way, another way that we protect ourselves is knowing how to use these firearms in a safe way, right? And so a firearm, and it's time for us to take a little bit of the stigma off. A firearm is a tool. Its, it's stated goal is protection, right? It's a tool. If you know how to use a tool in a safe fashion, it accomplishes its goal. If you don't, you can get hurt, right? So obviously we want everyone in the community to be trained to use the weapons in a safe fashion, right? And there are many, many black gun clubs who would willfully teach our members how to, every member of our community, how to do that. But we also will be recruiting other entities in order to teach us how to use these firearms collectively, uh, safely. And we're gonna get into that in a little bit. But as Musa D so uh, pointed out, um, every, in the, where's the Ida Wells? So uh, I would be well said that there should be a Winchester rifle on every mantle and especially for our people, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's a, I wouldn't say it's a no brainer. Um, there are, there have been things in place um, in order to prevent us from um, holding firearms, but we have to remember this is in Georgia. So our municipality is starting in Georgia where you can legally own a firearm, which is many people's concerns. Like, I live in New York, you can't own a firearm here, right? Our municipalities in Georgia, you can own a firearm and I'm pretty sure if I'm not mistaken, that's a stand your ground state, right? So anybody coming in 
to our municipality starting problems with us, they'll they will be well aware of that. Now we go into the whole municipalities aspect, right? And so the municip municipalities aspect was something um, emphasized early on by Ashley in the foundation of Freedom Georgia, right? That was one of the things that she stated as imperative is that we have to start a municipality, right? Well, we create the laws, right? We govern what the laws are and we have our own laws within our borders. So you come into our borders, you face our laws in, in, in our police department and so on, right? So instead of creating small neighborhoods, right? Where we really don't have any say in what goes on in our neighborhoods, we're pushing for, and our goal is to create a municipality. That way we create the laws, the boundaries are ours, and we create the police department. That is, a cute, is also a crucial aspect, right? Of making sure our neighborhoods are safe, right? Many times throughout history, when we've seen these acts of domestic terrorism aimed at our people, the police were in cahoots. Oftentimes they were in, in cahoots or they helped hide whoever was doing, you know, these violent acts. Um, they helped them get off. They even, you know, in any aspect you can think of, they help facilitate this terrorism. This won't happen in our municipality because the police force is our own. This is the most, this is the most critical element of protection for black communities is the establishment of municipalities. By having police departments, once again, what we do now, we hire those police officers. We have the oversight. We have the training. We dictate how this police department operates. All of the police officers in our municipality will know all of the people in the municipality who may have a mental disorder or something like that. The police officers who are a part of our community will live in the community that they're protecting. We'll know our police officers. So when we talk about having a municipality, we're talking about being able to satisfy all of the conditions that a community needs for an independent community. Um, having your own schools, having your own hospital, having your own libraries, your own commercial districts. All of the things that we need are within our city, within our municipality. Our municipality is patrolled by real policemen who have the power and authority to pull people over, to search cars, to do things that a security force cannot do. So when we think about what has been happening to us with the police departments, we have to be able to fight on multiple levels. And this is one of the levels that we fight. We create our own police departments by creating our own municipalities. We appoint our police officers and we have a direct say in how our police uh, departments are run. We are the ones who control the politics. We are the voting constituency. So when we're talking about protection, we need to operate within the lines. We don't have to have any vigilantism. We don't have to be fearful and think that every household needs to become um, a, a trained like a military veteran and all of that type of stuff. We're saying have simple, safe measures for protecting your home by having a firearm in your home, being trained, know how to use it. But we have a police department and we are the ones who pay for the police department. The taxes within our municipality pay for the police department. And we'll have a different relationship with all of the police. And the last thing that I'll say about the police departments is that they are connected to other police databases outside of the municipality that they're operating in. If they need backup, they have radio backup to other police departments. And they also are on federal databases and things like that. So we can pull people over. And if people are wanted and things like that, we can make sure that people that shouldn't be in our communities aren't in our communities. Uh, and these are things that we would not be able to do if we were simply a community. So our goal with the Black Achievement Fund and why we are partnered with the Freedom Georgia Initiative is to create 
our own municipalities. And right here in the state of Georgia, we have um, a couple examples within the past five years. You have the city of South Fulton that was created, which is an all black town. It has its own police department, its own city council, mayor, all of those things. And all of these people are black. Uh, for, I don't know about the police department, but I know that um, a vast majority of their police officers are black and they have the power to con dictate and control how their police department operates. So the Black Achievement Fund is about solutions, 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 solutions. But more importantly, we are about solutions that we can implement ourselves without compelling someone else to do something. We can start our own municipalities just like South Fulton, just like the city of Stonecrest, but in a manner um, that is even more representative of our African worldview. So this is how we protect ourselves. Real police officers, not a security team. In addition to that, you wanna talk about this other training, Jesus? Also active shooter training for the entire community led by our police department. So I work in a school and we have the, the police come in and train our school and school safety and others on what to do in case of an active shooter. So this is, you know, protocol throughout, you know, what the police department does. This is something that the police department does and our police department can do the same thing. Another advantage of our community is all police officers will know the community, right? So being that they live in the community and we're a tight knit community, everybody will know everybody. So you'll know, oh, this person has a mental disorder or this person has this, we'll know. And the second, or, or the beautiful thing about that as well is that if there's an outsider in our community, they're gonna stand out like a sore thumb. All of our community is created by our members. So we all know each other. We all have a database where you can see who's who and the cops are gonna know everybody who lived there, right? So anybody who comes in our community is immediately standing out like a sore thumb, right? So that's the beauty of having a police department that is actually part of the community. And that's a huge problem within, you know, the inner city and other places where the community is one thing and the police department are something else. No, we're gonna have them together and aligned along the same goals. And our goals are safety, right? And so that's the beauty of what we're attempting to create here. And it creates for a safer atmosphere. And it's going back to the solution again. If the police departments, if racist police departments are the problem, let's create our own police departments that don't have racist police officers that patrol the communities that we live and work in. And we have the power to create those communities, to start those municipalities, just as everyone else have been doing all along in this country. So that's the movement that we're trying to spark with the Black Achievement Fund, is that we can start our own and protect our own in line with how our country is already structured. We don't need to be this separatist community um, with this whole, you know, alien way of doing things, we can do things in line with how things are currently done and protect ourselves and live comfortably in the community without feeling like we're, you know, preyed upon. Right. Many of the instances of police brutality become are because of institutional problems, right? And one of the main problems, especially in New York, for example, is the cops who police the city aren't from the city and don't live in the city, right? So there's a huge disconnect between the community and the police officers. Also, these officers are essentially charged with fixing things that are beyond them. Our community is small enough and we care enough where we'll be dealing with a lot of things that won't even touch their plate. They don't have to worry about, right? They don't have to think about all these things because we'll be doing it ourselves. So their job will simply be safe. Right. And then finally, as being who wouldn't as an officer want to be a part of our community, you're a black officer, you know, all black community that's on a completely positive vibe, you know, everyone there, that is the best case scenario for an officer. So who wouldn't want to live there as a black officer who wouldn't want to be a police officer within our community. So again, these are all great selling points to recruit the best of the best.
when it comes to officers we want in our community. And again, solutions, solutions. We know historically that the police department and the police force was meant to re-enslave the African population, reincarcerate black men, put them to a level of servitude all over again. We know that this is the history. We have brilliant scholars who've talked all about this and we have been seeing this manifest itself all the way up to this day. And soon as uh, social media came into play and everyone started filming everything, look how many incidents have come to light. And these are things that we're just capturing, you know, have nothing to do with all the things that go unseen. So again, if we're gonna be a people and talk about solutions, let's first talk about the solutions that we have within our collective power to implement. We have the power right now to buy land, establish our own municipalities, have our own police department. We have the power to do that. We have been under this level of dependency uh, where we feel that we can't operate independently. And this is not taken away from anything else that's happening. All we're saying is that the solutions that we're implementing here at the Black Achievement Fund are all within our grasp to do. You know, us trying to have all of these reforms all across the country to clean up all of these police departments. How, how much of a fight are we putting into that? How much resources are going into that? We look at the Ferguson report where the Justice Department went to Ferguson. They did a, a study for two years. A whole book came out. I have the book. In the two year period that they studied, 96% of everybody that was pulled over were black. How, and, and, and nothing happens. There's no radical change in the culture over there as, and nowhere else. So we can sit and wait for incremental change through the political process, or we can use the political process and create our own municipalities where we have our own police departments. You know, you have, again, we just gave you two examples from the state of Georgia. Stonecrest and the city of South Fulton. Solutions, solutions, solutions. And so I, I see in the chat, the question was posed, you know, what can we do to, to change policing practices? And this is, you know, our situation or what we're trying to create is the, is the perfect solution to that. So number one, if there's in ever any instance of, you know, police brutality, that officer will be, gotten rid of immediately, right? Everybody knows who the person is. Everyone knows the community. We control the police department, right? So they will be removed immediately. But more importantly, how often will these instances happen when we're the ones picking who the officers are? We're the ones picking the laws and what, you know, what laws are to be enforced and how we're setting up the infrastructure for the, all that, right? So we're the ones deciding what the infrastructure for these things be are going to be we're the ones picking who is actually gonna be on the force, right? So we have a huge amount of control over that. And then I saw a second part of the question, we need to get rid of armed guards or police officers in schools. I work in a school where there are, not, there are no police officers. It's a charter school. We have an armed guard, right? But he's not a police officer. He's there simply to protect students, but he's not an officer. And you know, I'll go so far as to say that we never arrested anyone in our school for doing anything illegal because there's no police officer there. We can absolutely do the same thing within our schools and our community because we determine that. We have complete control over those things. So when we're dictating what happens, we can make sure those things happen, right? That's, that's the point of the municipality in general. And to add to that, because the second part of that question I see, why do we need police essentially in the first place in the community that we create? And that answer is why we're having this whole info session and that's protection. We need protection from outside forces, not necessarily forces from within, but as we grow and as we prosper, we have to look at history and make sure that we are doing things so that history doesn't repeat itself with our communities. So by having a real police force that is a part of uh, national 
uh, 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 chain of security for the country, essentially, and being tapped into that, it allows us a level of protection that us being in our homes trying to defend ourselves from anything. And we want some level of order as well. You know, no matter what you say, when you see that police car, official policeman, and you know what the consequences for certain behaviors are, you get in line in a way that you may not if that person wasn't present. So we need police officers until we don't, essentially. I mean, it's, it's, it's simply a resource. It's the shield and the sword, right? So the shield is for any legal actions where we're protecting ourselves, right? We want to be standing on good legal grounds, right? So if someone is in our community uninvited, doing something they're not supposed to do, we can't just go out as, as vigilantes and take them out. We have the law behind us now by having a police department that works for us, right? So we want the law behind us in a way that protects us and not harms us, right? And so also we want the resources uh, to be able to be able to be brought to bear in case, as our key said, something does happen. So the police force for us is something to protect our community, not to especially be used against us, right? And since we're making the laws, we get to determine what that looks like. And lastly, to, for the, to answer this question as well, by having a police force, we're no longer a soft target. When someone thinks of plotting on this now, it's not a community. Now it's a city with official police officers. That's a whole nother situation to have to contend with. So it elevates us from being a soft target to a hard target. That's the other reason why we need a police department. Right, there's, there's an automatic hesitancy to fire at an officer that exists within our community within the community as a whole, right? So they may take a shot at us. They're less likely to take a shot at a cop and they know the consequences of taking a shot at a cop. Now you got all of the police officers in Georgia looking for you and they're gonna be consequences. So, you know, it, it adds a level of protection also um, that we feel is imperative. Great question. Okay, what is, okay, what is your question then? Who are you speaking to? Kim, she said this doesn't answer my question. So I'm asking what is her question uh, specifically that she wants to answer? I think her question specifically was how do we change the culture of policing or how does that address the culture of policing? I don't think that we can, uh, for me, we're not here to try to change racism and all of that type of stuff because you're talking about addressing racism because that's at the core of the culture of these police departments. And we've seen this bear out. So you're talking about changing the core of racism. You know, that's a challenge that we don't know how to do. Well, I would say this, if I could, if I could attempt to answer, the culture that you're talking about is a specifically a racist, culture of policing, right? What you're talking about specifically is how do we change the way the police interact with us? And so the very culture of our police officers who we hire, who, are create, who we create the laws for, who work in, and live in our communities and serve us particularly, and they are also black, changes a lot of the culture just inherently, right? And so many of the things that create such a toxic culture towards our people have already been removed from the equation, right? Just by virtue of our setup. So I think that mitigates a lot of, you know, the policing, um, you know, the culture of policing. And yeah. black officers are fools too. Yeah, but we're hiring them. So again, when we hiring these people, there's a database. So there's an actual database of uh, police brutality, who's listed for, we can check through that. We can see what is this person like? We can interview them. Is there a history of brutality here? Is this someone we want on our land? We interview them. Are you someone comfortable living in all? So we can build in you know, those measures to make sure we have people that we actually wanna live around just like we have right now. So with the Black Achievement Fund, anyone living on that land, we have a screening process to determine who lives there, right? Are you a member of the Black Achievement Fund? 
Do you believe in these principles? We've seen you multiple times on the platform. Do we know this person? So there are many aspects that are automatically intrinsically built into um, the equation to help us mitigate this. Mm -hmm. And, and you can fire a couple hands. Okay, yeah. go ahead, P PJ. And then Musa D. You're on mute, PJ. You're muted, PJ. Hold on. Yeah, I couldn't unmute. There you go. So now, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, so um, I think I, I was hearing, I'm not sure if the name was Kim or whatever. And this is my question too, is that, you know, having a miss, just having a miss, municipality, I understand the rules and regulations that are beneficial in doing that. I totally get that. When you talk about police, the, the very nature of a police is, has nothing to do with what we're trying to do. Not at all. Um, protect and serve. Police don't do that. They do not do that. They were created to catch humans and bring them back. So we don't need more police. My question is, how do we get actually cops to protect and serve? Because that's what we want. And how do we change the culture of what police are being trained daily? Good ones and bad. They're still coming out of this deep blue and they do not look at humans. They are taught to, you know, see black people a different place, a, a different way, to see economically challenged people, mental people, people who have mental issues. Um, they're just not looking at the whole holistic person. How do we create that in our dynamic? Because we're going to have to start with a handful of people who have come out of that back. My son wants to be a cop. And it's, it's quite frankly, scares me daily um, because I don't see the metric that is there that says, hey, you know what? When this happens, this, you get one out of a million cops who are doing the right thing. And once they do do the right thing, it's so stressful, they, they eat their gun. So how do we find and change the culture of what policing is because it's about blue and then it's about um, segmenting culture. Uh, you, you, you know, you take a, a white person who's never been and uh, does not have enough uh, culture of black people or uh, non-whites in their world to have them understand that their privilege is having them walk into a place and already they're behind the eight ball if it's in a completely black area. So now they have to react in a way that their, their teaching taught them and not how as a human they should be acting. How do we change that? And are we prepared to know that the thing that we're doing has to be new, has to be different and like everything we're doing at BAF, it's a holistic perspective because I am not about to have guns in my household when I'm living in BAS. And I'm cool with my neighbors doing it. And I think that that culture has to be open to where it's not just a gun. Like Harkey said, you know, a gun is what kept us enslaved. It's not. If we believe that thing, something tangible is what's keeping us down, we'll never get up. Because the reality is that, you know, when Black people had guns, they still were not Oklahoma. People had guns there, but they had planes. So it's like, you know, the, the, the idea that a gun is what's holding me down, it's the culture of the mindset is what's doing that. We got to change the mind. Yeah, but the problem is that, okay, well, I'll- you, It's not yet, but. You, you can said be it, well, all, well, there, I would say, there are a lot of assumptions being made as well, though. Is every cop, is every police officer out to murder every black person? No, but I'm saying okay. that I'm right. saying where so they're coming you, from, where they're so, being taught. Right, I understand that. But so have, do you believe that there if it do you believe that there are black officers who actually want to protect and serve? And is it well, in, definitely in the I, state, I do believe within that the state of Atlanta, son, within the state of Atlanta? Within the state of Atlanta. Right, may I finish? 
because I want to actually answer your question because I think you pose essentially what the issue is, right? You articulated what everyone is thinking. And so I want to address it specifically because I feel like you encapsulated everything that everyone who has this question is thinking. Is that a fair statement? Okay. Okay. And so what my retort to that would be is that I believe that there's some officers who actually got into the job to protect and serve. However, when you're in an institution, it's just like teaching, just like teaching any other institution. You get into an institution with a good intention. Then you get in there and it's all dirty. It works a certain way. And in order to stay in there, you got to play along and do this and do that. And the next thing you know, you're part of something that you didn't want to do, but you're stuck in. I believe that there are officers in Georgia who are Black, who will protect and serve our communities, who want to serve our communities, right? And given the opportunity to work in an institution where they get to be what they actually wanted to be, will love to do so. And so if we present them with that option, I believe they will come and work for us. And I think obviously for a reason, we all have a certain mistrust towards the police, right? I, I get it, we all do. But there's some who actually may want to do what they signed up to do. And I believe in Georgia, we can find those people given what we are presenting, right? And I do agree with you, there's a lot of cultural things as far as policing that needs to be changed. We will have to work on those things, right? But it has to start somewhere. We, we can't just say, well, we're not gonna have a police force. They serve a very yeah, useful purpose. Course. That purpose is mostly our protection. The other thing about our community is with this police force, what are they gonna be doing to us? Nobody's breaking laws in, in, in Freedom, Georgia. Nobody's doing anything to even be spoken to by an officer. Their main purpose there is to protect us. So given all of this, is the risk worth the reward? I would say yes. And I would say in this process, we can actually reform policing into what it should actually look like, into something where people of the community are policing their own and the police actually protect and serve. On every aspect, the Black Achievement Fund is the vanguard for what America should be. It's going to have to start somewhere. And we can't let fear stop us. So that's my retort. And I, this is my last part of that. that. That part right there. My question foundation was coming from, what are we going to do when we get those, thank you, when we get those um, five or whatever amount of people that are good and went into the and to the police department to do the right thing. How do we take that and build onto those people? What are, let's talk about that. Let's talk about, well, or let's at least open that conversation about how we're going to do a new thing, how we are going to do this. We're taking the best because we do know all cops aren't bad, right? I would be terrified knowing that my son wants to do that, what he wants to do. I want him to go to BAF. I want him to be at BAF and learn like, okay, this is what a good cop is supposed to look like all the time because he's protecting and serving. His reason for wanting to be a cop is to make the communication between community and police officers better. So he's taking a deficit and trying to build on that. That's what I heard you say, um, Jesus, at the end, that that's what we're going to do. That's what we're trying to do when we have a municipality because I don't believe you can have a, a, a mass of people and not have protecting and serving. Thank right, you. And that's what we want to create. We want to create somewhere where your son can be an officer here and not have to fear the things he would fear in the outside community. Like that's what we want. We want people like your son to police our community. And from him, then the next group that comes in, he picks, oh, this guy, he looks like he's on point. But I will say this, and this is what Arky was saying. We also are not experts at this. We would need someone, right, within the police community who has done work like this and people like you, PJ, to work together to create this, right? So it's, it's, it's a communal effort, but it has to start somewhere. We already have a police officer within the collective. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so Ashley, uh, Musa Deek, and then Ashley. Thank you, Peace family. Um, I want to definitely yield to Dr. Dr. Ball too, who's been dropping some great points in the chat there as well. But what I wanted to say in reference to the culture of policing, et cetera, is that when you have officers or a community 
that is vested in the safety and um, protection of the community itself, that is a paradigm or perspective shift in itself right there, right? We don't have people outside of the community coming in to police or occupy a territory in which they see as though people are inhuman or you know, with maladies or uh, character defects that they're gonna be challenging, right? So I think the fact that our police or security members, however we choose to define what is essentially a police force. I mean, we can use whatever rhetoric we want, but it's going to be a police force and it needs to be. Um, but I think the fact that they are vested individuals from the community is the central element that is going to endear them to their jobs, to their communities, to their loved ones, and to the collective protection of the entire community. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, uh, and yes, I, I have personal experience from family members who are former military, who have joined the police department uh, with the best of intentions, and who ultimately took their life because they couldn't cope in a system where it wasn't really fostering the, um, the vested interests again, you know? Uh, so it all stems back to being uh, a part of the community that you're securing, which also endears you to the people and, you know, makes us all look at each other and respect each other as one. We have to believe that. Uh, and no, we don't have all the answers, but I think if we leverage the experience of our, um, of our uh, um, police retirees and officials, several police, black, black police uh, organizations um, have written uh, extensive reviews and commentary and leadership guides on how to really change the culture. I mean, and this is, you know, in the social structure, right? But we can use these fundamental principles as guiding tools to educate and have a basis, a fundamental level of education for the police department that we're, we're looking to um, to build. And I think we leverage what we have within our own uh, community with experience, right? With knowledge uh, uh, and expertise. And we have plenty of individuals already here that we can tap into. And that's 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 what I think. I like to yield to, to the pro. Excellent, excellent, excellent points, Musa D. And we have Ashley, you have the floor. Yeah, so good eve, good afternoon. Um, I was just going to share, this is a mind shut shift. So you hit it right on the nose, Musadiq. We have to understand that what we're building in freedom is infrastructure from the very ground up. And we get to choose to set the tone and the pace for what our community policing looks like. And all of these foundational um, guidelines that moves the deep talk about. My mother was a police officer. We have people in the collective who are police officers. Every police officer is not a bad police officer. And they do, they're looking for outlets and opportunities to be able to um, make a difference in this system. Because we all know that the system is rigged against Black lives in particularly, but that does not mean that we can't fix it, that we can't change it. Uh, and we really don't have to change it because in this instance, of Freedom Georgia's case, we create it from scratch and we get the ability to pull in those best practices. All the stuff that Dr. Ball is getting ready to come on and talk about, we get to lean in from those best practices and from those perspectives and foster for ourselves the kind of police department that not only will take care of internal issues, but really it is a shield so that when people on the other side of the gate, on the other side of the community come in and try to wreak havoc, that they can be that first line of defense. Look at what they did in um, Texas when they didn't want the Haitians coming in. They were able to use their police department to do that. And so we see how racism can affect us on how it continuously affects us, but we get to wear the other side of that uniform and we get to be the other side of that when other people try to do something that doesn't sit well with us, we get to put that police force on the front lines and say, no, you can't come here with that bullshit today. And you can't do that if you don't have a, a, a police force. So there is some power in from the ground up 
creating the policies, the procedures, the culture, and the real status of what it will mean to be a police officer in Freedom, Georgia. It'll be the kind of place that I hope people will be like, yo, I'm getting my criminal justice degree and I pray I get to go to Freedom, Georgia and learn the best practices of policing there first and then maybe go out to other departments and jurisdictions and be a real change agent and leader there. So that's what I wanted to in, in just express and I'll yield the floor. floor. Okay. Arky, you muted. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Rhonda is to, to Rhonda. You have the floor. Yeah. And I just want to back up what you said. It's just very important for us to understand <clears throat> That this is a matter of our survival. I mean, if we are to stand, we have to stand with integrity and we need order. And, and in order to be respected with that order, we have to come with the right things in, in place in order to get that done. So with the little comment, we definitely want to have that established where there is a, a safe zone. People can relax and enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? So the Black Achievement Fund... It's not, you know, it's not uh, harboring, harboring anything ill will towards it. It's a way of, of a process. And, you know, everything's a process in, in this nation here. But there are certain um, survival aspects of this that's really needed right now in the time we're in. And I think if we don't take a move on it, then we are, you know, losing sight of the actual goal here, you know, to be independent. So we have to protect ourselves just as it starts at home. And the Black Achievement Fund, this is our home. This is where we are going to start and let people see these solutions that we develop. Excellent point, excellent point, excellent point. And our police officers, we, we have the authority within our town where we're not having our police officers just pull people over for uh, revenue generation and all of that type of stuff and harassing people and things like that. Those guidelines that are set forth and given to those police departments, those are political decisions that are often handed down and things like that. So by us having control of our municipality, all of those stop and frisk and those types of policies and don't, things like that, those things won't exist where we are. Uh, I know others want to chime in. Dr. Ball, did you want to share some of your comments? I'm not sure if you guys can hear me too well. I'm a little bit under the weather today. Oh, can you, sorry can you to hear, hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can okay. hear you. <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with um, the comments um, that have been spoken thus far in that, you know, we um, have full autonomy to build, you know, the police force that we want. Um, we are the ones that are going to be designing, you know, the policies, the procedures, we're going to be the ones providing even the oversight. And from all of the personal accounts that I have received from police officers and the confidence of, you know, my office, you know, when they talk about the corruption that exists in their departments, this is corruption that is supported from within the department and actually encouraged from within the department. We're not going to be supporting that. You know, we are going to utilize a standard and fine tuned screening processes to bring in individuals that they're not even going to have that mindset. You know, yes, it is true that for a lot of especially new police officers, they puff out their chest a little bit more when they get that gun and, you know, they're, they're, they're fully, you know, authorized to be, you know, an independent officer and all that great stuff. But, you know, we'll allow for some degree of normalcy in, in, in a boosted ego, but there'll be a cap on that. And we'll have other um, experienced, you know, officers there to ensure that, that we're not letting things get out of hand. So it is just so important for us to realize that we have the control. We don't need to fear the structures that we put in place because we're actually putting them in place. And we'll have the ability to make modifications as necessary. If we see that there's a rogue officer or someone, you know, for whatever you know, reason, seemingly getting out of hand, then, hey, you know, you, you bring that person in, what's going on? 
And if, you know, we see a, a pattern developing, that person's out. You know, we can make sure that we don't, you know, utilize, I don't remember what the term is called, but what is it like the, the full immunity where police officers can just about uh, do almost anything and get away with it. We can make sure that that is, you know, that none of our officers even have the false impression that 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 there's the slightest possibility that they have that level of immunity um, or any immunity for that matter. So, you know, we just need to keep in mind that we have the power to shape what our community is going to look like because we are building it, as Ashley said, from the ground up. We are building it from scratch. So we are no longer needing to worry about fixing broken systems. We're designing our systems. So that's going to be a huge advantage for us. And when we change our mindset, when we change even the definition of what our police force or what our police officers will stand for, that's going to be very powerful in shaping their mindset as well as our mindset so that we view them more as safety officers as opposed to people that are just there to terrorize us and scare our children. Very, 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 very well said. Very well said. And once again, guys, we're talking all solutions here. We can't try to, you know, change the culture of all of these police departments all across the country. We don't have the power to do that. We do have the power to start our own municipality. We do have the, the power to, like Ashley, like Dr. Ball, like the Freedom Georgia Initiative is taking the initiative in, starting our own police department. You know, we hire them. We screen them, you know? So when we, we're, we hire the police chief, we tell the police chief what type of policing we want in our community. So once again, everything that we're talking about with the Black Achievement Fund, everything that is happening with the Freedom Georgia Initiative is about Black independence. It's about self-determination. It's about us understanding that our world truly is in our hands and that we can curate these municipalities in the way that Freedom Georgia Initiative is doing in a way that we begin to set a new standard and we begin to uh, exemplify how all of these systems should be working. So that's what we're doing here with the Black Achievement Fund. That's what Freedom Georgia Initiative is doing. And we're all focusing on solutions that we can implement. Kim, you have your hand raised, you have the floor. Yeah, I appreciate um, this conversation um, and the fact that we're listening to one another. Um, that's really important, but I still haven't heard what kind of policing are you even talking about? Um, because I know I'm part of a movement to get police out of schools and and working on that kind of work, even how they are interacting in you know my local communities. I just want to. I just need to hear why would you need police and what does that look like? I haven't heard us you know paint that picture. What does that mean? Well, I don't foresee us having police officers in a school that in a city that we're doing screening kids coming in and all of those types of things. Again, what Ashley and Dr. Ball are saying is that we are curating this community from the ground up. So those types of questions that you're asking, these are questions that you'll be able to ask in an actual setting with other people that are members of that community. And as these the police departments are being designed as these members are being interviewed, you know, you'll have the opportunity to be a part of that process. I'm going to yield to Ashley so that she can speak more directly about what's going to be happening with um, uh, Peter Georgia. Yes, thank you, Arki. And that's, and that's a good point where Arki just shared. Uh, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. And it's okay to not know. We have to create it. We have to implement, like, if, if you know you're doing this work, you should be on the committee. That's the point of us designing 
these systems and these structures because they don't exist yet. We don't even have the first building yet. So we don't necessarily have to even worry about like, no, we don't need to have police in schools. Or maybe we do if we feel like our school might be a target of terrorism because of the fact that we are now graduating more Black scientists and STEAM people than they've ever seen. And now some white person gets mad and wants to come into the school and blow it up. We might need police for that. But if we don't have someone there whose mindset is that I'm here to protect our Black generation, our children, our community, then that type of thing, somebody walks in and nobody thinks nothing of it, right? So it is important that we plan to have a police structure and system in place. We might not call it police. Maybe we decide to call them peace officers, so that people who actually are trained to keep the peace and not try to get us um on you know uh get us to put us in jail because that's not we don't even want to have a jail in freedom policing and freedom will look like and in, in my eyes if someone does something they ain't got no business doing we have a committee or a community committee that takes place and that's who um what people first foremost when it comes to internal um things that might happen where we need to have justice like at the end of the day we don't always treat each other the way that we should treat each other so there has to be some kind of systems and structures in place for community justice right and so we might not necessarily know every way that that looks like what we have to be committed to is doing what dr ball says Let's find what the best practices are. Like Musa Dick said, there's all these black leaders who write all these uh, guidelines and we've got manifestos of what we should be doing in our community. And instead of ignoring what these wonderful people have put together, let's pour over it. Let's figure out, okay, let's take a little bit of that. Let's take a little of that. Let's make us a police gumbo so that we know that what we need to save us can be in place to do it because we're more concerned about the benefits of the policing that we can capture finances um, from the state and federal government that could maybe go towards actual public safety and what public safety might look like is more lighting in dark places. Public safety might be uh, cyber, uh, making sure our, our elders are not being targeted, right? Like we get to choose how we use funds that come from the state and federal government for our community's public safety. And so I, again, I don't know, I don't, none of us have all the answers, but what we are committed to doing is working with the people who live in our community, first and foremost, the people who put their money to little commit, the people who put their money down and buy land, the people who put their money down and buy houses in freedom, they get the first voice and the opportunity to say, let's do what we need to do to have the kind of policing that our community desires. Cause it's about community engagement, community action. And it's not about just taking what these European systems have and dumping it in the freedom and saying, we're gonna do what has always been done. Our goal is to really look at best practices and choose what practices are best for us. And maybe some practices that don't exist yet. We might innovate some things and that's cool too. And we have to have people who are passionate, who are engaged in um, activism around policing and criminal justice reform so that we know we are implementing the best practices that are not just about putting people in cages, but abolishing slavery. Because we know that slavery is just in the prison system, right? We're smart enough to know that. And so we don't want to turn our police into slave cat, cat, captures, catchers. That's not our intention. Our intention is to have our police be a military force for our community. So if somebody tries to um, terrorize us, we have the protection and the means to make sure that that does not happen. And if we don't have a police department, then we're going to be sitting ducks and we definitely can't have that happen either. So having a balance and using these uh, psychological testing and assessment, like Dr. Ball said, we should be in a position to truly really, you know, design something new and empowering for how other people can say, you know what, they're doing it right in freedom. Let's take a book page out of their book. And to, really quickly, but, we have other hands. Oh. Really quickly, what you're saying, I think what Cam is saying is 
How does this look on the ground? Are we going to be getting pulled over by cops like we are in other places? Um, are, is our criminal justice system going to look like the criminal justice system and other communities and all of those things? And what Ashley is saying is that this is why we're forming a community, is that everyone has a say in how all of these things are shaped. And this is why we're trying to curate communities based on a shared value system in the first place. I, I even um, uh, talked to Ashley and company about not having a jail at all in Freedom, Georgia, by instead banning people for a length of time. You don't, we don't got to lock you up, but we ban you from our town. All right. You banned for two years. You banned for five years or you banned indefinitely until we decide that you can come back that sort of thing. So there are a lot of innovative ways that we're already thinking about how we want our society to be um, uh, 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 police, if you want to even use that, uh, that terminology. Dr. Brother, Dr. I think that, I, um, I guess the conversation started out that, you know, people would get training, you know, like to protect themselves and things like that. And then when you go off into the police station, then it's like, okay, wait a minute. I thought we was protecting ourselves. No, no, you no, know, no. It's not either or. It's, and it's, then you brought in. Yeah, no, I'm just saying or. the reason why I was just a little, it, it just, the conversation just went left for me because we started out in one place and then we went so far in another place that I just wasn't ready to have that con conversation. So it just brought up all these other things. So I respect the conversation and I'm glad we're having it. I just wanted you to know where my head went and went there, okay? I got you. Peace. Yeah, we, yeah, we started off, like you said, talking about um, how we protect ourselves individually, but we did that to provide the context in saying that protection starts at home first. You know, that we first individually have a responsibility to protect our home. And um, on top of that, then we have to worry about how do we protect our community. So that's why we began and we kind of went left a little bit. Dr. Ball, you have the microphone. Um, so to also add to, to Tim's uh, point, um, you know, yeah, definitely both are needed um, because any sort of police force that we're going to have is not going to be um, an overwhelming police force so that if we do face, you know, some attack from the outside, we may very well need the community members to come out and support our police officers in defending ourselves. So making sure that we um, have the ability to not only protect ourselves in our homes, but also join in forces to protect our community, um, that's going to be very important. And I've seen across the country where um, uh, that is, is, is just the standard way of living. You know, there are so many, um, you know, communities, especially small, you know, Southern communities where, you know, you walk into a house and there's a gun over, you know, each doorway. Everybody in that house knows how to handle, you know, the gun. Um, but they still have, you know, a, a police force that 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 they're using and they trust and believe in, um, you know, also speaking to, you know, what our police force or, you know, uh, peace force or safety force will um, will look like. Um, I think that, you know, this discussion obviously uh, drums up a lot of intense emotions for, you know, a lot of us because of our relationship. Um, you know, with the police, whether it's personal or, you know, the vicarious relationship that we've developed over time through things that we've witnessed happen to community members, family members, or, you know, just over, <clears throat> just over uh, media. Um, an important thing that, that we will need to do is make sure that we uh, disincentivize you know, any sort of, of, of abuses, any sort of, of, of things that can in the long run or short run, run be harmful to us. So there have been comments about, you know, we don't need um, a jail. Um, yeah, totally. We don't need a jail. In fact, we've seen, uh, Ashley and I, we've seen, I'm not sure if you were there or Keith, like, were you there? Did you go to Saren? Uh, I want to be with you guys. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
um, you know, they didn't have a jail. And, you know, I asked their mayor, um, what do you, like, how do they handle issues with, with community members that are breaking the law? And I, as a joke, I said, like, are you guys like begging them? Because every time that they arrest someone, they have to lease uh, I guess, space from a local jail. So it can get expensive and, and they don't want to do that. So I'm like, so are you guys like begging people like, please, please, please don't do it again. He said, yeah, basically. <laughs> You're like, Can you please not park here again? Please don't do that. And so in that community, um, you know, any sort of harassment or arresting people or roughing people up is it, it's disincentive incentivized. Yes, it's and it's built in. So we can utilize those sort of practices. So our cops or safety officers or whatever we decide to call them, they don't even want to bother with doing that because they know that it's going to cost extra money. It's going to cost extra time. So they'll be more likely to be like, look, little Freddie, I've told you before, Okay, you cannot park here. Now, do I have to go and tell your parents about you parking here? That's the sort of, you know, community policing or, or safety officer policing that officer policing that I want to see where, you know, we're having conversations. Um, even if they're repetitive conversations, we're still having those conversations um, <clears throat> to ensure the safety and, and order and protection of our community members. Mm -hmm. Great, 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 great point. Great point. Great points. Are there any other questions? Are there any other comments that we should address? Rhonda, is your hand raised? We have Rhonda yeah. on the floor. I, yeah, a couple of things. And then Mr. Uh, Cornelius wanted to say something too, who's a BAF member. Okay. Um, one thing is we want to remember Black Wall Street. We need to right have layers of security and, and also foster that trust no matter what name we call the individuals. You know, we don't want to go back to any time that uh, where we can't build with what we have and, and have those connections where we can have those, you know, defenses in place. So never say never. I mean, you know, there is some examples of South Philly do have a no cop zone. That's what they call it, you know, but there is uh, other things that you can look at what, you know, and this is innovative. This is, you know, fostering a good uh, wholesome environment. So yeah, the accountability partners who brought that up, that that's a good suggestion. Great, great. And Mr. Uh, Cornelius, he yes. wanted to. There's also, I would like to add also, uh, long-term commitment it's like we, you know, once we get this thing up and rolling, we would like to have something like a, a, a mentor where we can teach the young people what's going on. So that way we have little, our little special sessions where we can teach them uh, pretty much as uh, handling firearms as far as like learning and preaching and teaching, you know, because they would have to learn some type of skills as far as where we at in order to keep us, you know, Keep the family oriented situated. That's a session going on. plan to right. our security. Yeah. For like the young ones, you know what I'm saying? The young ones, I would take them as early as 10, 12, nine years old, as long as they have a, you know what I'm saying? They can consume much more in situation. We can get things, a whole lot of things done with a younger generation as of coming mm -hmm. up now, because because this, this is our future. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the young ones to pick this up and roll with this because. We're making a way out of no way, you know. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're making a way out of no way. And we're starting from scratch. And we're starting from scratch with a group of people who all share the same values and all want to see the same type of police officers or peace officers patrolling their communities. So we now have the ability to make these things happen ourselves as opposed to trying to compel somebody else to do it who has no interest in doing it whatsoever. So we feel that it's much smarter to assert our energy in this direction than the other. So um, essentially it's, it's cutting, you know, it's a shut and dry. We're gonna protect ourselves like all other communities across this country protect themselves. And that is with the police department, but it's with the police department 
that we put together. It's a police department, like Dr. Ball said, that we ultimately provide the oversight. You know, we're not create, we're not, uh, everything is brand new from scratch. And the last thing I'll say is that, I, I believe Ashley mentioned it, is that how this thing is gonna look is gonna change over time. You know, there's going to be a certain plan that we'll need when we're a smaller community. And as we grow, there may be different needs. So the purpose of creating our own municipalities is that for once, we truly have the ability to be the decision makers in all aspects of the institutions that affect our lives. And last but not least, in Creating our municipalities, the design of our communities will incorporate a lot of safety measures. And obviously we won't talk a lot about what those safety measures will be, but <laughs> once again, we just want all of our members and all of you out there to know that we are proactively thinking about how are we going to secure not just the communities that we build, but the new cities that we build like Freedom Georgia. We don't want you guys to have any fear about joining the Black Achievement Fund. We don't want you guys to have any fear about becoming residents in Freedom Georgia because you know we are making ourselves a target and all of those sorts of things. We're living in a different time period and we can't allow anything to prevent us from cultivating communities that we wanna be a part of and establishing cities and towns just like everybody else. We just have to understand that we have so much more power than we ever exercise. We think that the only power that we have is through the vote, you know, and that's not the case. Even the civil rights movement, the, the, it began with the boycott, but yet we don't talk in those terms anymore because maybe we don't think we have the discipline to really do it to where it's successful. But when you come to our platform, the Black Achievement Fund, everything that you're gonna hear are solutions that we as black people ourselves can implement right now. We don't have the power to radically change the political structure of the whole country right now. We don't have the power to infiltrate the minds of all of the races and convert them to peace loving you know, human beings. We don't have that, but what we can do is to begin to create these model communities in which we exemplify all of the best virtues of all of these institutions. And we can showcase the fact that these things can exist and they can work properly if the proper people are put in place. And that's what we're doing by creating our own. So if we don't have any other comments or questions, we are going to end this info session on how we're going to protect our communities. And with that being said, I'm going to take us to our Little Kimmet um, fundraiser. Hey, Suze, can you take us to our fundraiser page? Let me see. For all Mine. of you who have not made a contribution, any other comments or questions, we are going to end this. You are, uh, you are right there. You want me to do what exactly? You're muted, Archie. He wants you to bring up the little Kimmet um, um, campaign. Got it. Okay, and I'm gonna put, post a link in the chat as well for anyone who's interested. So for those of you who haven't made your contributions, please make your contributions. We actually are going to be buying double the amount of land, 12 acres instead of six, because our architects and developers informed us that in order to do it right, right, we need to double it. So that's what we, we've done with the uh, generosity of the Freedom Georgia initiative. So we want to give them another round of applause again for working with the Black Achievement Fund. Thank you, ladies. But we need to make this happen. We need at least 200 members to contribute $500 to our Little Kimmet retreat. And this will help us generate $100,000 
for our first phase of our fundraising and financing. And we're going to have another phase. So we need this to come out. All right. All right. Hey, Suze, so let me see the donor wall real quick. We're at Can 18. you click on donor wall? Oh, we have 90. So for Christmas, the Black Achievement Fund, for Christmas, we don't need you guys to leave cookies for us under the tree, no eggnog. We need a donation to our little Kimmit members retreat, all right? It's not going to pay for itself, and it's not going to just rise out of the ground, you know, like a phoenix. It's not going to happen that way. We got to make it happen. So we need all of you guys who believe in all of these things that we're talking about to put your money where your mouth is. Every little bit counts, and we have an easy pay. Hey, Suze, can you hit the donate so people can see how easy it is to do the easy pay for five hundred dollars? Because we know sometimes money is tight, but twenty five dollars twenty months is your five hundred. Fifty dollars a month ten months is your five hundred. A hundred dollars a month five months is your five hundred. Two fifty a month two months is your five hundred. And as you see, there is a custom amount. So if you want to give however much but we need you to make a contribution. We need to show and prove that there are enough people in this country right now who believe enough in other black people in black economic independence and black unity and all of these things that we promote that there is enough of us where we can at least raise $100,000, you know? So show and prove everybody, please show and prove. All right. Also, we want you guys to continue to share these videos on YouTube. Our YouTube stats are really, 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 really good. So thank all of you guys for subscribing. Thank all of you guys for liking and making comments. We are on our way to a thousand subscribers that we need to start monetizing our um, YouTube page. So please continue to share and make the donations. And if you are not a member to the Black Achievement Fund, Jesus Christ. All right. Come hey, on so now. Take us to <laughs> show them how easy it is to join. <laughs> Man, $9 a month. Three cents a day, Man, people. Three cents a day. 10 million of us. That's $90 million every single month of tax-free capital to begin to finance the grand development of Black America. We have the opportunity to not just do Lil' Kimmit and Freedom Georgia, but we have the opportunity to do a hundred of these across the country. We are a sleeping giant. It's time for us to stand up, all right? And $9 let, let me, a month. And guys, just think of this. Last year, when we celebrated our birthday on Juneteenth, we were on Black-owned land. This year, we're going to be on black owned land from BAF. We are coming up. We are coming up and we are rising everybody. The, the story that's gonna to be told is how did they do it? <laughs> we did it collectively. Watch our steam. We are like, like Lil John said, what? <laughs> yeah. We rising. Come on, three cents a day. Y'all just like two, two minutes ago, y'all lost three cents. Another two minutes. Ago. It's in your couch. I guarantee you right now. If you're in your car, look for it. It's in your car. It's in your baby shoes. Look in the baby um, um, stroller. It's there. Come on, guys. You can't keep saying you want a better world and you have the opportunity and you don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Ambassador PJ from the Cali side. We're going to make this happen, guys. We want to make sure that you guys are out there listening and understand how critical and important it is for us to demonstrate Black unity, for us to demonstrate that we have the ability to come together and do all the things that people saying that we can't do because we can and we've been doing it. And here's just another example that we're gonna be doing it, but here's the twist. We're doing it collectively. Everything that we own, these 12 acres that we're buying, we own this collectively. We own this collectively. We're gonna share this collectively. We share in the prosperity collectively. 
That's what the Black Achievement Fund is about. So if you have not joined, please join. There's nothing to think about. $9 a month, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Every dime is 100% tax deductible. And if you don't like what we're doing, just stop giving your $9. But we're out here doing it and we need your support. So please join today if you have not. If you've had ambassadors, if you had other members contacting you, calling you about the Black Achievement Fund, what they're saying to you is how we win. So make it today that you go on and you honor your dedication by becoming a member and putting your money where your mouth is, www.baf.solutions. All right, people, until Wait, next Hold a time. second. Wait a minute. Hold a oh, second. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a question. Got another member, Keisha. There's a question here from um, uh, Miss, uh, is it Reginald Brown? Um, is the seven day pass retroactive to those who donated to Kemet before the seven day pass was added? So I guess the question is initially, there was supposed to be maybe one day or something like that when you gave over $100. Now that we're adding four more hundred dollars to that, do you now, if you, you know, yes. make all yes. 500, do you get the seven days? Yes, the answer is yes. If you've previously given five hundred dollars before we made that announcement, then yes, you will you're, uh, you will be honored with the seven nights for each five hundred that you've given. So if you give a thousand dollars, that's fourteen nights that you're going to get. So that's for every five hundred that you get. So if you've given a hundred so far and you give another four hundred, then that counts as your five hundred and you get the seven nights. Okay. And then for all the people who want to be in the gold t-shirt gang, if you can't get oh. your five members, get your $500 donated. So everybody who donates $500, same thing. Every 500 gets you a gold tee. Every or, five members gets you a gold tee. Or 500 donated or five members donated gets you a gold tee. And our uh, founding five membership drive. Right now until December 31st, Whoever gets at least five members to join the Black Achievement Fund, you get one of the coveted gold member T-shirts. All right. So make sure when you get some, when you talk to someone about the Black Achievement Fund, to tell them to put your name under who they learned about the organization from. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, for signing up, and we will see you again shortly. Peace. Peace. Peace, black Thank love. Y'all. Power to the people, family.